As the second wife of King Henry VIII, Anne Boleyn was one of the most powerful women in the world in the 16th century. In fact, Henry's desire to annul his first marriage to Catherine of Aragon so he could pursue Anne is widely credited as a key factor leading to England's astounding break with the Roman Catholic Church in 1533. Even so, her peers at the Tudor court didn't hold back when it came to their ideas about her. Contemporary descriptions of Boleyn painted her as a seductress, as power-hungry, and even as a witch with six fingers who enchanted the king. And those descriptions stuck. For hundreds of years, Anne Boleyn's bad reputation has run throughout both conventional historical narratives and popular depictions of this period and there's been no shortage of them. The story of the woman who had been Henry's queen for only three years before he ordered her beheading in 1536 on charges of treason has retained public interest. Boleyn was a member of Henry's court, serving as a maid of honour to his first wife, Catherine of Aragon to whom he was married from 1509 to 1533. The king became smitten with Boleyn and pursued her, but she refused to become his mistress. The king had been making inquiries in secret about divorcing Catherine of Aragon years before Boleyn came on the scene, and Boleyn actually resisted the king's advances. She ran away from the royal court for a year, starting in the summer of 1526 to escape and Henry's love letters appear to encompass the time when she was absent from court, distancing herself from his advances. But within a year, he proposed marriage to her, and she accepted. In order for Henry to marry Anne Boleyn, his marriage to Catherine of Aragon needed to end. Though divorce was not allowed under the Catholic Church, Henry VIII persisted in seeking one. First, he argued to Pope Clement that his marriage to Catherine could be annulled because she had been married to his brother Arthur, who died shortly after their marriage. Henry based this argument on a biblical passage in Leviticus that condemns marriage between a man and his brother's wife. Therefore, Henry claimed, the Pope who granted the marriage had been wrong do so in the first place. When the Pope refused to annul the marriage, Henry took a step that would change the course of world history and religion. With the help and manoeuvring of Thomas Cromwell, Henry broke ties with the Catholic Church in Rome, affirming the King's view that the Church should not have power over England's sovereignty. The King and Anne Boleyn were secretly married in January 1533, causing Henry and the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, Thomas Cranmer, to be excommunicated from the Catholic Church. This, in turn, led to the establishment of the Church of England, a major step in the Reformation that added England to the list of Protestant nations. Anne Boleyn, who came from an aristocratic family, had served in the courts of other European royals. She was educated and skilled at the diversions expected of a charming member of court, such as dancing, singing, and the game-like art of flirting. But she also had political functions at court. Like her father, a diplomat, Anne played a role in greeting foreign dignitaries and had some influence on matters of international affairs. In that capacity, she engaged with political leaders, including Thomas Cromwell, a politician who rose to become Henry's chief minister in 1532. The king and his new queen enjoyed a reasonably happy accord with periods of calm and affection. Anne's sharp intelligence, political acumen and forward manners, although desirable in a mistress, were, at the time, unacceptable in a wife. After a stillbirth or miscarriage as early as Christmas 1534, Henry was discussing with Cranmer and Cromwell the possibility of divorcing her without having to return to Catherine. Nothing came of the matter as the royal couple reconciled and spent summer 1535 on progress. By October, she was again pregnant. 
At this time, Henry began paying court to one of Anne's maids of honour, Jane Seymour, and allegedly gave her a locket containing a portrait miniature of himself. While wearing this locket in the presence of Anne, Jane began opening and closing it. Anne responded by ripping the locket off Jane's neck with such force that her fingers bled. Anne Boleyn fell from Henry's favour when she failed to give birth to a male heir. In 1533, she bore a female child who would grow up to be Queen Elizabeth I. But Anne suffered miscarriages and her only male child was stillborn in January 1536. At that point, Henry decided to make a change. He had been having adulterous relationships with two of the Queen's maids of honour, Madge Shelton and Jane Seymour. The latter was fast gaining the king's esteem. Meanwhile, Boleyn and Cromwell were clashing on matters of foreign policy and the king's finances. Anne argued with Cromwell over the redistribution of church revenues and foreign policy. She advocated that revenues be distributed to charitable and educational institutions, and she favoured a French alliance. Cromwell preferred an imperial alliance and insisted on filling the king's depleted coffers. Historians are divided on the extent of Cromwell's motives behind facilitating Boleyn's demise, but in setting up the charges against her, he was certainly carrying out the king's wishes. Cromwell was part of a secret commission, one that included Boleyn's father, to investigate her wrongdoing. Historians speculate that her father probably tried to warn her of the situation, but there was little she could do. Boleyn was accused of sexual affairs with male members of her court, who in some cases were tortured into making confessions. In addition, she was accused of incest with her own brother and of using sorcery to bewitch the king. Many historians suspect that the charges against Boleyn were at least exaggerated and at worst wholly fabricated by Thomas Cromwell. However, the Queen's lack of privacy and her deeply held religious beliefs would have made it difficult to be unfaithful at all, much less with multiple men. Boleyn was sent to confinement in the Tower of London, and her trial took place on May 15, 1536. On the morning of May 19, 1536, Anne Boleyn stepped out of the Queen's house quite gaily. She was wearing a grey dress edged with fur and a pearl-studded headdress. The guards led her to the lawn in front of the Green Tower, where courtiers and aristocrats were gathered. The executioner stepped forward, and Anne didn't even see the flashing sword. Her head was cut off in a single blow, and the executioner held it up for the crowd to see. After the thousand spectators vanished, Anne Boleyn's body still lay where it had fallen, the blood draining from the stump of her neck to patter down through the boards to the grass below. It was at that point everyone realised no instructions had been given as to what was to be done with her body. The king had given detailed instructions of every step in this process thus far, down to what type of cloth should bedeck the scaffold, but nary a word on what should happen to the body of the woman he had once loved enough to defy the crown heads of Europe and break a thousand years of religious tradition. No one knew what to do. They waited, hoping word would come, but there was only silence from the king and council. Eventually, someone, possibly Sir William Kingston, constable of the tower, made the decision. A coffin had not been provided, but they did not want to put her body directly into the earth. She was, after all, the Queen of England. A shipment of bow staves, intended for troops in Ireland, had recently arrived at the armoury, and they decided to use the storage chest as a coffin to enter Anne's remains. It was brought to the scaffold.
Anne's body had been stripped of its clothing, likely down to her shift. The clothing of the deceased was the prerogative of the executioner, part of his expected payment. The rest of Anne's belongings, left behind in the royal apartments, belonged now to William Kingston. Later, the council would pay him a hundred pounds to buy it back. They wanted no souvenirs of the dead woman surfacing. Anne had removed her grey damas gown on the scaffold before the sword fell, and her ladies were likely the ones who removed the scarlet kirtle she wore below to give to the executioner. The cloth of it would have been too voluminous to fit in the bow stave chest anyway. Anne's ladies wrapped her remains in white sera cloth, a heavy wax-coated cloth used for burial shrouds, and placed them in the chest, her head tucked beneath her arm, because the chest was too short for normal placement. They carried the makeshift coffin to the tower's chapel, and dug a shallow grave to the left of the altar. There, Anne was buried beside her brother, in consecrated ground, but with no funerary rites. She would later be joined by her cousin, Catherine Howard, another of Henry's ill-fated queens, and Jane Parker, her sister-in-law. In the Victorian era, the little chapel had fallen into a sad state of neglect. Queen Victoria permitted a restoration and ordered the graves beneath the sinking floor to be exhumed with an attempt made at identification. This proved to be much more difficult than anticipated. On removing the stones of the pavement, it was found that the resting places of those who had been buried within the walls of the chapel during the troublous times of the 16th and 17th centuries had been repeatedly, and it was feared, almost universally desecrated. When the tower ceased to be a residence of the sovereign or a state prison, the chapel appears to have gradually come to be regarded as a mere ordinary parish church in which the interment, not only of those who had lived in the tower, but even of residents in the neighbourhood, was freely permitted. It is true that the bodies of those who had perished on the scaffold, or died as prisoners within the walls of the tower, were buried, no doubt intentionally, in great obscurity. But even if some memorial stone had recorded their burial place, it is doubtful whether that would have protected their remains. It is even feared that in some instances coffins had been designedly broken up and their contents scattered in order to make room for some fresh occupant of the ground. When a new burial occurred, the remains of those buried before were shoved unceremoniously aside in a jumble of bones. The spot where Anne Boleyn was supposed to rest was occupied by a lead coffin belonging to a woman who died in 1750. The archaeologists believed they identified the remains of Anne Boleyn, based on the graceful physical characteristics of one of the skeletons found near the location, her remains were supposed to be buried, though modern historians tend to doubt the identification. The final report stated, The bones found in the place where Queen Anne is said to have been buried are certainly those of a female in the prime of life, all perfectly consolidated and symmetrical, and belong to the same person. The bones of the head indicate a well-formed round skull with an intellectual forehead, straight orbital ridge, large eyes, oval face, and rather square full chin. The remains of the vertebra and the bones of the lower limbs indicate a well-formed woman of middle height with a short and slender neck. The ribs show depth and roundness of chest, the hand and feet bones indicate delicate and well-shaped hands and feet, with tapering fingers and a narrow foot.
For a long while, it was said the square, full chin conflicted with the portraits of Anne, which show a narrow, pointed chin. However, in the modern era, the real face of Anne Boleyn has been shown to be closer to the Nid Hall portrait than the most widely recognised portraits. And indeed, Anne may have matched this description. The bones were also said to be from a woman around 25 to 30 years of age, and those who insist on the 1501 birth date say this proves the bones cannot be hers. Some scholars speculate that the bones belonged either to Catherine Howard or Jane Parker, both of whom ended up under the chapel floor. And we cannot discount the possibility that the bones were not any of these famous persons. They could have been the remains of one of the tower residents. Recently, the story that Anne Boleyn's heart was secretly buried in St Mary the Virgin Church in Irwerton was revived. In the 19th century, a small casket was discovered, which the residents believed contained the heart of Anne Boleyn. Anne's ladies were recorded by witnesses as being very upset after the execution. The Bishop of Rees describes them as being half-dead themselves. They were concerned her remains would be treated disrespectfully, and so they interred her as quickly as possible. Given their emotional state, it's unlikely one of them cut open Anne's chest to remove her heart. There is currently a movement to have Anne exhumed and reburied with the honours due a queen, but it's unlikely to happen. <laughs>